All right, if you remember, I've been starting these past messages with uh, this slide, the rapture, September 25, 2022, that's in two weeks from now. And uh, th this is not the only person pushing this. And you know why he's pushing this like this? Because he can't read. Because see right there it says no parking. And that's exactly where he's parked, where it says no parking. <laughs> so he can't read, and a lot of other people are unwilling to read the scripture. That, that's just a fact of life in the day and age in which we live in. It's, it's just a fact of life. People have itching ears. They want to hear what they want to hear. And if they don't like what they hear, they'll just turn you off and say, I'll listen to that guy. Which is fine by me. But uh, in social media, there are few secret groups who are in line with this whole thing here. That the rapture is in two weeks from now. And that's why that I'm taking this opportunity to discuss this subject now because it is so prominent in the world. And many people, this is their hope. This is what they, they're, they're anticipating. Some people are maxing out their credit cards. You know, say, well, I won't, you know, I won't, I won't be here, so I won't have to pay them back. Well, what kind of attitude is that? And why are you buying things that you're not gonna, even going to be here to enjoy? You're just wasting money? Well, you're going to find out. You're going to get stuck with those bills. They did that Harold Camping, Camping, same thing. He's gone now, so who knows who's doing this. But next week, we're going to talk about date setting and date setters, many of them who've done it over the years. And you would think that somebody would get the hint now. Setting dates on the rapture is not a good idea. It's just not a good idea, okay? Now, last week I mentioned that the rapture teaching came from a man called Edward Irving in London in the 1830s. And... That's where it began, where he saw, or thought he saw, that it would be necessary to have a resurgence of the spiritual gifts that are found in 1 Corinthians chapters 12, 13, and 14, which include a lot of visible manifestations. And so one of, the, one of his students, Margaret MacDonald, uh, matter of fact, I was on my way, my way to see my wife this past week, and I, on my way there, I got a phone call from one of the people who watches us. And I had said, told everyone, you can Google this. Go search it out. You'll see. I mean, I'm not making this stuff up. It's all over the place. That they are the founders of this thing called the rapture, not John Nelson Darby. And Margaret McDonald, this is the part the guy told me, I didn't know. She was, she was 15 years old. 15 years old. When she became very ill. And she'd been listening to Edward Irving and his exciting messages about the resurgence of all the gifts. And during her illness, she started getting visions. So who knows what kind of fever she had, right? Right? And in one of those episodes, the vision told her that the second coming, of which the Bible is filled, which has been spoken of since the days of Christ, before Christ, the Old Testament is filled with the doctrine of the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's, you know, that's common, common teaching in the scripture. But she said that the second coming would be in two parts. The first part would be a secret coming to catch away secretly the true believers, those who were truly saved. And then after that, the Lord would return, as, it, as was you know, clearly prophesied throughout the Word of God. And I wonder how many of you find it strange that a doctrine that was founded by a 15-year-old Pentecostal girl who received visions during an illness 
that she was going through at that time, how many of you find it strange that that little girl established a doctrine that has captivated Christendom to the point where they fight over it ever since then? Well, I personally, not only do I find it strange, I find it extremely troubling. And I find it troubling that I allowed something that came from that particular source, it troubles me that I allowed myself to get snagged into the middle of it without even questioning. And I didn't question like most of you. Don't question it. Don't question what you hear from your pulpits. And so, now that I know the source, I just put it to the biblical test. Now, what's the biblical test? Well, in James chapter 3, you do have a biblical test of doctrine. This is just plain flat, transdispensational truth. But James 3, 14, But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. In other words, if truth or doctrines that you learn create strife and arguing among believers, like the doctrine of the rapture has created more strife, more arguments, more fighting amongst believers than any other doctrine in all of human history. James says, verse 15, This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, Sensual, devilish. Sensual means it came out, it comes out of some emotional experience. It's a sensual thing. Devilish means it comes from the devil. It doesn't come from God. Verse 16. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. Now, what's been more confusing to believers than the pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, pan-trib? What's more confusing than that? And why would you believe one of them? Because you happen to attend a certain building, a certain box, a certain denomination that favors a particular position and because you go there, you embrace it with your whole heart. That's your responsibility is not to embrace what you hear from a pulpit. That's not your responsibility. But notice verse 16. Confusion in every evil work. Envying and strife. I'm going to tell you, envying and strife is what characterizes the teaching of the secret rapture. And so James compares the wisdom that is from the devil with the wisdom that is from above. Verse 17, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated. Entreated means easy to be received. I don't have to argue with myself. I'm not going to have a check in my spirit. I'm not going to walk away going, gee, I don't know. Do I prefer the pre, the mid, the post? That's not easy to be entreated. A subject like that is not easy to be received. Okay? So... I'll tell you this, not everybody in Christendom has received this teaching of a secret rapture. For the most part, Christendom does not embrace this. It is a few select groups that embrace this, but Christendom at large does not embrace this particular teaching. Many, many have rejected it. It has become very popular in the United States, but again, it's not easy to be entreated. It's filled with strife and arguing 
like I keep saying, pre, mid, post. How, how is anyone qualified to accept one of those teachings? How are you qualified to accept any one of those teachings? I'm going to read verse 17 again. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality. What's more partial than this particular teaching that we're looking at? And without hypocrisy. So, you know, as I look back upon it throughout my journey in Christendom as a believer, as I look back on that, I realize that that doctrine has been a fear tactic that has been used by many preachers for many years. So this doctrine does not pass the James 3 test. It doesn't pass it. It fails. Flunked. F. Because it doesn't pass this test. It's not an acceptable doctrine because of these things. So what we're going to do today is we're going to examine some of the second coming verses of which the Bible is full. Because we can establish exactly what that is. We can, exact, we can establish what takes place at the second coming. The scripture is full of descriptions of it. And we'll look at them. Last week I showed you some verses from 1 Thessalonians. Just going to rehearse this real quick. Where Paul is writing to these people that ye would walk worthy of God who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. There's not a person today who is a believer who's called unto this kingdom. You're not called to reign in that kingdom. Like Israel is called to reign in that kingdom. That, that's their deal. So Paul is writing to people who are going into the kingdom. He confirms it. In his second epistle to the Thessalonians, notice he says, 2 Thessalonians 1.5, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer. So here's people who need to be counted worthy, which is in perfect keeping with Israel's program. Those who are not counted worthy will go through a purging process. How all that's going to work out, I'm not exactly certain of that, but I know that that's not you and me. I know that's them. And whenever you find suffering, the suffering and the kingdom together, you know that it's talking about Israel and their earthly kingdom. And it, you know it has to be about them going into the kingdom because according to the, according to the narrative... You're going to be out of here. According to the narrative, you're, you're supposedly you're going to be out of here before that kingdom shows up. So everybody should know this has nothing to do with you. How can Paul be writing to you when, according to your narrative, you're not going to be here? See, see the, the disconnect there. There's a disconnect there, right? And then you remember how we looked at the church of God that Paul persecuted. He writes to them in his pre-prison epistles. These Thessalonians are also part of the church of God. Notice 1 Thessalonians 2.14, For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God. That's what they became followers of. The churches that Paul persecuted. <laughs> you know? Yeah, that are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. 
So Paul is writing to people who became followers of the churches of God. That's, that's the churches that Paul persecuted before he was arrested on the road to Damascus. That's who he persecuted. Now, the reason I'm showing you these verses is because Paul wrote something to the Thessalonians. And with this understanding of the little flock that he wrote to, people who had believed that Jesus Christ was their Messiah, that's not how you are reconciled to God today. That's not how that happens for you and me. We don't do, we don't believe that, we know Jesus Christ is the Messiah of Israel, but that's not the method of your forgiveness and your reconciliation with God. It is not. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is your method. It's my method. So, when we understand that he's not writing to us, then we're better equipped to understand and we can make a comparison now that we can understand much easier. For example, Matthew chapter 24. You can turn there if you want. You can find Matthew 24, for, you know, 1 Thessalonians, Thessalonians chapter 4. But notice here, Matthew 24, 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. This is the second coming of Jesus Christ. Okay? It's called, Then Shall Appear the sign of the Son of Man. It says, supposedly, this is at the end of the tribulation period, Daniel's 70th week. And I'm just going to throw this in. I don't know that all the information we have about Daniel's 70th week has, is absolutely accurate. I'm not sure of that right now. I'm not sure we know everything that there is to know because... A lot of the details of Daniel's 70th week are predicated upon a secret rapture. And therefore, there may be some things we have missed. Or those who teach that have missed. I don't, okay, but anyway. But Jesus Christ says, Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Okay, and appearing is something that is visible. A magician shows you a handkerchief, shows you both sides, and then a dove comes out of nowhere. A dove appears out of nowhere. That's an appearing. The dove wasn't there. <laughs> the dove is there. That's an appearing. Something visible is manifested that you see with your own eyes. That's what, it, that's what an appearance, things you can see with your own eyes. That's why Jesus Christ said, and they shall see the Son of Man. They shall see. That's an appearing, okay? So at the second coming, there are certain characteristics that identify that event. And then if you see these characteristics in other verses, then you don't have to guess what event that you're looking at. If it's the same characteristics, it's the same characteristics. It's not going to be the same characteristics for all kinds of events. This is a specific event. It's the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what are these, what are these identifiers? Well, you've got the clouds of heaven. You've got angels. 
You've got the sound of a trumpet, right? You've got gathering together. These are identifiers. They are prophetic language. They speak of something specific in the Word of God. This is not abstract language that you can throw around and make it say something other than what it's saying. It is very specific and detailed and inspired. Amen? The second coming of Jesus Christ is like a fireworks show. There's a lot of bells and whistles and visible things going on. Angels, trumpets, nothing secret about that. But the rapture, oh, because it is an unprophesied event, has to be secret. It has to be secret. It's not prophesied. The way we were taught it is that Jesus Christ would appear secretly to secretly catch away his church. Secretly. That's how you and I were taught the doctrine of the rapture. That's how you were taught it, right? You know, it's like uh, so many movies were made about the rapture, right? Like you see, you know, there's a group of people sitting in the living room, you know, husbands and wives and children, and they have their Bibles in front of them, and they're talking about the rapture. And there's a lady in the kitchen. She's not a believer. But she doesn't hate them. You know, they're at her house. So she's in the kitchen making snacks. She can hear them talking about being caught away. And, all that, and she's working. In the, and all of a sudden she walks in the, the living room with her tray of... Everybody's gone. Bibles are there. The clothes is there. The shoes are there. And she drops the platter. She, she's sure in that mood. They're all gone and she's left. And what kind of fear would grip a mother's heart knowing that her husband and her children were just taken away and she's left here to face the Antichrist? What kind of fear does that produce? You understand why I say it's, it's a doctrine of fear-mongering? Fear-mongering. That's the teaching of the secret rapture, the whole Left Behind series. They made multiplied millions of dollars on those books. Right? What's amazing to me is the verses they use to substantiate the secret rapture. Okay, we just talked about the Thessalonians being little flock people that Paul wrote to. And I'm going to tell you, th that's really a study that you should, you should do yourself. Read 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. Read it slowly. Look for the prophetic language that Paul uses. Because you need to be convinced in your own heart. You need to be convinced from your own study of the Word of God, not from my study. You know? I mean, I will teach you something right now that if you believe the words on the page, you won't be led astray, but... So, you see these verses on the board right now, right? This is clearly the second coming of Jesus Christ. Clearly. And please, don't be afraid to read Matthew chapter 24 either. Because there's a lot more in there than just these verses. There's a lot of details. Okay? And then you just read it and see for yourself. You know, underline these things in your Bible. Underline these things in your Bible. And then you'll know in your own heart what God is saying. 
because it is now my understanding that we have been duped for many years because we listened to preachers and we believed what they said, but we never checked out what they said for ourselves. When you check it out for yourself, that's when you go, hmm, they're not saying what the Bible says. And that's how I ended up leaving all the boxes I was in. In my, in my journey since the time I believed that night in January of 1984. You know, I'd go, hmm. They're not, they're not saying what the Bible says. And then I would leave. You know, well, I'm done leaving boxes. Because I'm never going to be in another box again for the rest of my life. And if you want to stay out of boxes, then... You stop listening without verifying yourself. You need to know in your own heart what God himself is saying. You need to know. Not what so-and-so is saying over there and so is saying in Virginia and Georgia and Chicago and what are they, oh, well, what do you, know, people call them, uh, hey, what about this? Yeah, and they try to get their answers from them. You have your own Bible. Go to your Bible. Don't go to men. And please do that. What I'm giving you right now is the best advice any preacher will ever give you. Don't believe men. Believe the Bible. Believe the words on the page. So, again, here is the second coming of Jesus Christ. All of the manifestations, all of the identifying marks that are associated with it, it's his appearing. Like I said a while ago, it's like a fireworks show. Okay? Now, what I want to do is look at the most famous secret rapture verses in the Word of God and let's ask ourselves, are the verses we're going to look at teaching a secret rapture? Okay? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. Now he's descending. There's not a place in the Bible that says Jesus Christ descends, comes halfway down, turns around, and goes back. There's, that's not found anywhere in your Bible. You will never find those words. You will never find that thought. You will never find that concept in your Bible. The Lord, when he descends, that's Revelation 19. When he comes back with his two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. From heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, you notice something about these verses? I'm sure you do because, in case you missed something, notice here you've got angels. You've got trumpets. The trump is the sound a trumpet makes when you blow it. That's the trump of a trumpet. Right? And you've got caught up together. You've got clouds. So let me ask you this question, okay? This is very basic. I want to try to keep this very simple today. What's the difference between this event... And this event, what's the difference? We've got the same things, right? We've got clouds, we've got angels, we've got trumpets, we've got gathered together. So what's the difference between this event and this event? What's the difference? I will tell you what the difference is between this event and this event. There is none. They are the same event.
Even in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1, Paul talks about the coming and our gathering together. Matthew chapter 24, you've got the same thing. The, the, the trumpet, the gathering, the coming of the Lord. This is all prophetic language. Prophetic language. That's why this event is the same as this event. They're the same thing. And Paul will confirm this for you. Paul doesn't leave us dangling here. I mean, if you're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, I want you to notice how obvious this becomes. If you look at the end of chapter 4, the last words are, and comfort one another with these words. Then the next words you see on the page are chapter 5. <laughs> right? Okay, those words are not in the original. There are no chapter breaks in the originals. Those were added by the translators to make it easier to find things. Just like there are no verse numbers. None of that exists in the originals. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. Sometimes those chapter divisions are, can be misleading because people think a new subject is beginning. And that's not true. When the, if you remove that chapter 5 and you kept reading, you would realize a continuity of speech. Paul did not stop at verse 18 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and then said, let's have a coffee break now. And, uh, you know, when you come back, we'll keep going in our session today. That's not what Paul did. That's not what Paul said. He continues. He continues speaking. And this is what he goes on to say. After these words, but of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord, he tells you what he was just talking about. He's talking about the day of the Lord. Cometh as a thief in the night. The thief in the night is the language of prophecy. Not the language of a secret catching away invisibly of people from this place, from this planet. It's what Jesus Christ said himself about his own coming. Notice. But know this, that if the good men of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched, would not have suffered his house to be broken up. 2 Peter 3.10, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Paul's not confused about the language that he is using. He's not confused about that. These verses are explaining what he said in the last verses of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So, you know, as you can see, there's nothing secret about the event of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So, it cannot possibly be what we have been taught is going to be our secret rapture. So, our job now is to find this secret rapture in the Word of God. That's our job. We need to find it. Okay, if it's there, I want to know. Okay, if there, anybody wants the rapture to happen, it's me. In two weeks from now, even so, come Lord Jesus, right? I would love that. But I'm also realistic enough to look at what the Bible says and go, well, okay, well, let, let, let's understand what the Bible is saying, okay? So what we're going to do, oh, I had forgot to put that verse there, sorry. What we're going to do is we're going to begin backwards in the Bible. We're going to work our way backwards and look at the comings of the Lord. Backwards. And eventually, as we do that, we're going to come to a place where we're going to go, 
There is the secret rapture, right? It's like uh, the inevitable conclusion. you you got to get to it somehow. But let's go to where we know what the Bible is talking about. We'll work our way back and, you know, at one point we're going to go, ah, there it is. Or we're going to go, we've been duped. So that would seem to me like the right way to find this secret thing that we've been taught about, okay? And we won't be able to cover every verse today. There's a lot of verses on this. I mean, there's a lot of verses on it. There are many. But we'll begin right there, Revelation 19. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. John 1.1 1, 1. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he should rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now we know there's nothing secret about this. We can ascertain that easily. This is what many verses in the Bible call the appearing. The appearing. I mean, that's what the book of the Revelation is. The book of the Revelation. The Revelation is removing the cover off of it. Ah, like the magician. Ah, you, now you see. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's the appearing of Jesus Christ. So let's continue to move backwards. Jude chapter 1, verse 14. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Now we're taught at this secret rapture that he's coming to secretly steal us away, not this executing judgment. And the word judgment means making things right. That's what it means. To make things right. And how will he make things right? He's going to convince all. He's going to convince them. That's how you show someone they're wrong and help them to make it right. You convince them that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. He comes to execute, he comes to make things right by convincing these ungodly people that what they were doing was wrong. So when his judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. That's how it's going to happen. Okay? I know people love the idea of total destruction and annihilation from, you know, God who must be some kind of monster. Some Greek mythological god of destruction. And then we'll move back further. 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, we sh for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. 
Now, I'm going to tell you something. Today, in the dispensation of grace, you cannot purify yourself. You can't do it. This is writing to a group of people who must maintain a sure walk. They must make their calling and election sure so that an abundant entrance will be granted unto them into the everlasting kingdom. Everlasting kingdom being Aeonian kingdom because we know it's for a thousand years, so it's a temporary limited period of time. How simple of a concept that is now. But they need to be pure if they're going to reign with the Lord Jesus Christ in his kingdom. And I'm talking today to people who should know that Hebrews through Revelation are written to Israel under the law. Every one of us should know that. I realize many people don't. But those who understand the dispensational character of the Word of God know that not everything that's written in the Bible is written to us. Okay, we know that. And I, I know that there are some people who will be listening to these You don't know about that yet. But... You come to the right place to learn how to rightly divide the word of truth, because we still rightly divide the word of truth. Amen. And then in 1 Peter chapter 5, we're moving further back. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. We don't need to elaborate on this verse. We know it's the second coming of Jesus Christ. It has to do with his appearing. He shall appear. So is this verse, that the trial of your faith, 1 Peter 1, 7, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So his appearing is not anything secret. And that's the point I want to reemphasize throughout as we continue today. An appearing is not a secret. Or invisible. You know, like the magician. Shows you the handkerchief, both sides, then a dove pops out. It's a real bird, real feathers. He's really flapping his wings. He really appeared. That's an appearing. To make the word appear means something else than that. In other verses of scripture, just means that someone is trying to make the Bible say what they need it to say based on the narrative they're trying to protect. That's what it boils down to. For example, as we move into Paul's epistles, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now here's the amazing thing about this verse. This is a verse that is actually used and quoted by many people to prove that the rapture is our hope. That's what they use. They use it for looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let me share with you this, this obvious fact. Once you see this, you can't unsee it. There are two events in this verse. There's the blessed hope. That's one event. And there's the glorious appearing of the great God. Question you have to ask yourself is what's the blessed hope? Is it the secret rapture before the glorious appearing? Because the glory, doesn't the glorious appearing just ring of angels and trumpets and clouds and gathering together? Yeah, that's what a glorious appearing sounds like. But I'm going to submit to you that the blessed hope is the resurrection. It's the resurrection. Yeah, amen. That's, those two events are in this verse. And let me ask you a question before I continue. You know, when I was hoping for this thing, the secret rapture, hoping for it, longing for it, praying for it, even so, come Lord Jesus. There was a day 
when I ask myself this question, what if God has a better plan than that? What if he has a better plan than taking away all these people and all these airplanes all over the world crashing and ships colliding and trains colliding and highways filled with cars mangled all over the world? What if he has a better plan than that? That doesn't include all that stupid nonsense of destruction from a loving Heavenly Father and from his Son who said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. How does that same God turn around and create that chaos to the people he forgave? How does he do that? My goodness gracious. But this is a glorious appearing. It's glorious. <laughs> glorious. There is there are things we've understood about our Bible that we've understood wrong about our Bible. One of them is this destruction. I know the words destruction are in the Bible. I also know that he destroys and he fixes. He makes sick and he heals. He kills and he makes alive. I, you know, none of those things are a problem with God. You know? So, notice also 2 Timothy 4.1. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Timothy's a little flocker, by the way. Timothy was never a member of what you call the body of Christ. He was never a member of that. But anyway, that's another subject. The Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge, judge. Is he supposed to be judging at this secret rapture? There's no judging at the secret rapture, is there? The way we've been taught it. But here, he shall judge the living and the dead at his appearing. There's nothing secret about an appearing. Especially when the appearing is connected to his kingdom. Because we know that's not you and me. The thing... With the, you know, the, the, the movement that we were in. If Paul wrote it, it has to be a secret rapture. It can't be the second coming. And I know if you're a mid-Acts preacher, you are bound. You are handcuffed to protecting the narrative that you've been taught. You're handcuffed to it. You can't escape it or you'll end up like they've done to me, calling me mentally retarded and everything now. Okay? You're gonna, that's how you're going to end up there. And I know many of you are so afraid of that because the praise of men is more important to you than the truth of the Word of God. That I know about a bunch of you. You are bound by your narrative to make this a secret rapture when an appearing is not a secret. So these people think Paul only spoke about the mystery. Let me tell you something. There's more than, there's more than one mystery Paul spoke of. You know, he spoke about the mystery in Ephesians chapter 3 of Gentiles becoming part of the body that already existed. That's a whole other story that most people you've never thought about. One of these days we'll get there, but there's so many things now that have to be reworked, re-understood, at least in my understanding. You don't have to go there. That's where I'm going. Notice also right here in this verse, 2 Corinthians 4, 8, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. The way that you're always taught this, 
is that it's the rapture, that it's the secret rapture, and you're secretly taken out of here. But this verse is not talking about that. Notice, it's talking about a crown of righteousness. A crown of righteousness and the righteous judge. Does Jesus Christ come according to what we learned in the secret rapture to judge? No, but at this appearing, he's coming to judge. That's the second coming of Jesus Christ. No matter how you slice it, that's what it is. It is not a secret rapture. It's not in these verses. You remember a moment ago, we looked at Revelation 19. We saw those verses that he returned as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. There's only one time when Jesus Christ returns in that capacity. It's at his second coming. Not a secret rapture, right? Here's Paul talking about Revelation chapter 19. For those of you who think he never talked about anything except the mystery program. Which people got that through Stam and O'Hare and then all the people who copied everything they said. Look at these verses. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 14. That thou keep this commandment. This commandment. He's writing to Timothy, the little flocker. Okay? That thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing. Until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Let's not lie to ourselves, folks. This is the appearing, the appearing of Jesus Christ. And Paul makes it clear that he's talking about when Jesus Christ is revealed as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That's the second coming of Jesus Christ in Revelation chapter 19. Paul knows more about prophecy than any of us. Well, I'm a former mid-Acts preacher, but <laughs> any mid-Acts preacher, any preacher on earth. Saul of Tarsus knows more about prophecy than they do. There's a reason for that, by the way. But the only people who are confused about this is those who have to force these verses to make them fit into a mold that they were taught they're supposed to fit in. The only people Confused about this is people, is those with a narrative they're trying to protect. Well, I'm no longer trying to protect anything. I just want to look at the scriptures and I want to say, this is what God says. And I'm not going to try to make it fit into anything. God's word does not fit into men's paradigms and men's molds and men's dogmas and men's narratives. That's not how the word of God works. You don't make it fit into what you want it to say. You fit what you understand into what God is saying. That's how it works. Now, there are many verses we'll look at next week. Because I don't have time to go through. There's a lot more verses about this. But when I first left the mid-axe box, I became aware that the verses we looked at today, because they were all secret rapture verses before, they were all secret rapture verses before, I thought they had to do with the secret rapture. That's what I was taught. That's what I embraced. That's what I believed. That's what I received. That's what I taught. 
I was going to say vehemently again, but <laughs> not the right word. But there came a day when I could plainly see that these verses are not talking about a secret rapture, that they are talking about a prophetic program. And it became very clear to me. Well, actually, as I was looking at all these verses and going, man, none of these are talking about a secret rapture, okay? So here comes more trouble, right? You start seeing the scripture like that, you go, oh boy, you know. Here goes a whole bunch more. And then I ran across this verse, and I thought, there it is. We have our secret rapture verse. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. And I remember thinking, this has to be it. But the more I studied those verses with the word appear in them, I realized that this is talking about the same thing. It's the appearing. It's the appearing of Jesus Christ. Like Paul said in this verse, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, you know, I've tried to help people understand in the past that the little flock, during, while Paul was still alive, they all, were always surrounding him. Although he had persecuted them, you know, he met them. He, he made his amends with those people. He wrote to them. As we've learned in the past, But this truth, this truth, like his appearing in his kingdom, even Jesus Christ on the road to Emmaus, on the road to the Emmaus, he told those two, then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Entering into his glory happens at the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's when he enters into his glory. Right? And then, at his appearing and kingdom. How can you not see his appearing and the kingdom? It enters into his glory. That's what the kingdom is. That's what the kingdom is. That's where the, his glory, the throne of his glory. The throne of his glory. And then when he says, ye shall also appear with him in glory, all three of these verses are talking about the same exact thing. You know, and I've said before, Paul in his epistles, he always mentioned and thought of the little flock. He never did not write to them. And as I look at this now, I realize what Paul talked about in his ministry the only thing he talked about was the appearing, the second coming of Jesus Christ. He never once meant anywhere a secret catching away to remove you from here. He never said that. It's not in the Bible. Everything we've looked at today, you can see, is an appearing. It's an appearing, which cannot be a secret and it cannot be invisible. Important question is, do you want to believe the Bible? So I'm going to close today by asking you this question. What is death? What is death? When we've looked at this in the past, so I'll help you. Death is a return. That's what death is. It's a return. It's God's plan. It's a good plan. It fixes everything so easily because death is not a problem for God. God told Adam, in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. That's the promise God made to Adam. That's a promise. This was going to happen. Did God know he was going to do that? Of course he did. 
and he made provision for it. After Adam disobeyed, we read, we read this. Genesis 3.19, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. That's what death is. It's a return. For out of it was thou taken. For dust thou art, unto dust shalt thou return. And this is confirmed several times in the scripture, Ecclesiastes 12.7. Then shall the dust, that's man, return to the earth as it was. That's what death is. It is a return. Temporarily. But that's what it is. And the spirit, God breathed into man, man became a living soul. The spirit that God breathed, that returns back to God who gave it. That's hell there. And your body and your soul that held somewhere else, that's part of a greater, more beautiful plan. Psalm 104, verse 29. Thou hidest thy face, they are troubled. Thou takest away their breath. They die and return to their dust. That's what death is. It is a return. It's a good return. You know, I'm walking in, in these places where my wife is, right? This is a rehab place, but I'm telling you, it's also like, a, like the last step place for many people. Because I walk through the hallways, I go by these rooms, and people are just like, like they're, you know, old people. They're not moving. I bet. You know, they're all like, and it's sad. And you just think, how many of them know the gospel of salvation? How many of them even ever heard it? properly in this day and age not many right and they have to leave that state and condition and then be cast into an eternal conscious torment burning lake of fire on top of all this mess that life has given us this is God's plan right here this is God's plan a return a return Psalm, Psalm 146, verse 4, His breath goeth forth, he returneth to his earth. And that very day his thoughts perish. Romans 5, 12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, because that's the wages of sin, the wages of sin is death, like God told Adam in the day you eat thereof, you're going you're gonna to die. And so death passed upon some men. Death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. 1 Corinthians 15, 21, 22, For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, all die in Adam, even so, all those in Christ shall be made alive. No, that's not what it says. No, it says even so in Christ. Just like all died in Adam, in Christ, because of what he did, shall all be made alive. Hebrews 9, 27, as it is appointed unto men once to die. But after this, the judgment. Ecclesiastes 9.10 Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with all thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. Ain't nobody out there right now in eternal conscious torment. Ain't nobody playing volleyball with the Lord. This is it. Ecclesiastes 9.5, for the living know that they shall die. They just know it. But the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Psalm 13.3, consider and hear me, O Lord, my God. Lighten mine eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Death is likened to sleep. It's not sleep, but it's likened. Like, because when you're sleeping, you're just like totally out of it. Right? 
People could slap you around while you're sleeping and you wouldn't know anything. So the testimony of Scripture from one end to the other end is that all men will die. Can you see that? God told Adam what would happen. God told Adam he would die. And then the Bible confirms death all the way through. All the way through. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Finally, we get to the last chapters of the book of Revelation when death shall be no more. There's a day coming when that's all going to end. But this is God's great plan. Great plan. What's the first lie that was told in the Bible? The first lie that was told in the Bible is thou shalt not surely die, spoken by the devil to Eve. So listen very carefully to what I'm closing with today, right now. When I hear a preacher say, that you're going to leave this planet without dying, I know he's quoting the devil and not God. And if I see people who are thinking that they're leaving this planet without dying, I know they're following the devil and not God. So the important question is, whose side are you going to be on? Because that's what it boils down to. You're either going to be on God's side who has a beautiful plan for humanity, which includes death. It's a beautiful plan. Because in that resurrection, brother, Everything that ever happened here is going to be contrasted with what's going there, what's going to happen there. And what a great and a glorious time that. That's God's plan. That's, his plan is superior to every man-made device that has ever been laid out before Christendom. Because if you think that you're leaving this earth without dying... You are living a lie. Because that's not going to happen. There is a word, I should say a verse, in the Word of God, written specifically for people like you. It's found in Job chapter 6, verse 20. It says, They were confounded because they had hoped. They came thither. They came to the end of the, what they were hoping for, and they were ashamed. The word confounded means disappointed. They were disappointed when they realized that they were going to die too. And then when they arrived thither, they were ashamed. They were ashamed for all the things they said about people who saw things differently and ultimately were right. So next week, we're going to continue this subject until the 25th. Okay? Because on the 25th, I want to be preaching on this subject. And this part. And they were ashamed. It won't happen. It won't be happening on September 25th, 2022. It's not going to happen. I promise and I guarantee it upon the authority of the Word of God. I guarantee it on the authority of Scripture. You've been duped. And you've bought it. And you've held on to that. And now you're, you're angry. And you're upset that someone is exposing the lie. You're upset about it. I know you are. I know many of you are, but what would you rather have? A fantasy and a fairy tale? 
or the truth of what God says himself. I would say, go with God. Go with God. Not the devil. Let's pray. Our gracious God and our Father, I'm thankful for the word of God. I'm thankful that I don't have to apologize for the word of God. I only have to apologize for having been stupid and believing things that were told me without verifying them myself. But I thank you, Lord, for your word. And I thank you for the truth that is found in it and the clarity that is found in it. And if we'll just believe the words on the page, we don't have to be led away by the error of those who have narratives to protect, who won't admit the truth because they're too proud. Since they've taught this for 50 years, how could they change their mind now? But I pray for them, Lord. I pray for their hearts. I pray for the conviction to just come upon them and a check in their spirits when they preach this doctrine, knowing all the verses have to do with the appearing and nothing is secret about an appearing. I pray for them. I pray for their people who have had to listen to them and their people who are also afraid to say anything contrary because they know what's coming for them also. Rejection and hatred and name calling. That's what's coming. Because that's the MO of so many people today. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the peace that passeth all understanding. The peace that can only come from understanding what a great God we have who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. I pray that the words of this message today will find lodging in the hearts of my brethren. And I pray they will be forged upon the tablets of their heart with an iron pen the pen of a ready scribe, the pen of the word of the two-edged sword of God. I pray these things in that name that is above every name, the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.